Greetings travellers and welcome aboard the Big Yellow Bus for our first excursion into Innsmouth in 2022. I'm one of your guides, Rob Poynton. And I'm the other one, Tim Mendes. And uh, we're heading straight into town today to Tim's shop because uh, I think hopefully festival season has finished now, isn't it? I think so. I think so. I, I, I uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it was relatively quiet when I came through yesterday. I thought we were like, packing up and, you know, disappearing back into the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> Good, good. So it should be reasonably safe. Well, anyway, as safe as Innsmouth gets. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, exactly. Never totally yeah, safe. Yeah, still don't don't get down the waterfront. Just just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a couple of minutes before we get into town. Just time to mention a couple of news items. And Tim, I hear you've been invited to a convention this year. Yeah, I'm going to uh, EasterCon, um, which is it's over Easter weekend, and it's up at Heathrow. Um, the Radisson Hotel at Heathrow Airport, just outside of Heathrow right. Airport. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a big one. It's the uh, it's reclamation. It's the big um, science fiction fantasy convention thing. It's some like I think it's something like seventy second or seventy fifth one. I don't know. Wow. But it, yeah, it's, it's looking going, really cool. Going for some time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so far, there's uh, like there's registered like four hundred and fifty odd guests registered or something like that, which. Is, like it's much bigger than what I've been doing before. <laughs> but yeah, it's supposed to be. Move, a, it's supposed to be a good one. Moving, moving up in the world. Eh? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely gonna. I'm trying to do more of these kind of things. Uh, you know, so spend like my first couple of years of being a writer, I spent sitting in front of my laptop on <laughs> doing it all over bloody Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> it can be a lonely existence, yeah. a solitary existence. Oh, it can, can. <laughs> spend more time talking to a computer screen than anything than an actual human being. Yeah. <laughs> Madness. So, um, how's uh, Corridors coming along then? Yeah, that's coming along really well. We've got all the stories in now and we're just about ready to put the first draft out uh, for our authors to check. We've got 13 stories, uh, ranging from uh, a few thousand words up to an epic 21,000. <laughs> That's from uh, Mike Slater and Miguel Fligur of uh, Combined Talents again to produce a really, really cracking story. It really is good. Oh, nice. So we're nice. on course to hopefully get, well, publication probably the end of January, maybe the start of February. Um, oh, excellent! And I think we we got yeah we got the cover sorted out as well. Now we've got a really nice bit of artwork for the cover. Yeah. Did you go with that underground? The yeah, it's it's kind of a hooded figure in a very strange underground tunnel. So that works. <laughs> the, the the setting, just in case anyone hasn't heard us mention it before, it's a new setting we've developed for the Innsmouth Writing Circle to play in, to, to set these stories in, and it's a post-apocalyptic. And mankind has retreated underground following the return of Hastur and the King in Yellow. Or possibly, nice. everything's a little bit vague, so nothing's quite certain. Oh, yeah. Well, but, that's how uh, it should be, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. King in Yellow has got to be vague, hasn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if you like your Robert Chambers, then hopefully you'll enjoy this. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, obviously we'll post up uh, all the information once it's out. Great. So, I hear, see we're pulling into town now. If uh, yep. you'd like to follow us, ladies and gentlemen, remember to take all your belongings. We're just going straight into Tim's shop today, but do keep close. No wandering off down dark alleyways, please. <laughs> yep, come on in. And uh, what are we reading today, Tim? Ah, fat face. Well, look, I, I know I ate a bit of extra over Christmas, but there's no need to be rude about it. I mean, we'll <laughs> oh, 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 right. Got, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah fat Michael face, Shay's yeah. Michael fat Shay's face. Michael Shay's fat face. Of course, I do beg your pardon. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Michael Shay is not an author we've covered before. No, no. He's, uh, he's, he's one of my favourites, I must admit. Uh, his mythos stuff is some of the, some of the most interesting because it's quite different. I mean... It's like this story we're going to cut. It's like I can't imagine Lovecraft ever doing anything anywhere close to this. <laughs> yeah, it's like he updated the mythos, really, isn't it? Into a very, uh, very gritty, well, quite a specific setting, really. Yes. Uh, ho Hollywood, particularly in the 80s, the real seedy side of Hollywood in LA. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most of his stories are set. Uh, his Cthulhu mythos stuff is all set uh, around the same sort of area, sort of in. You know, it's the sort of the arse end of Hollywood, you know, the, the what he describes as the porno 
porno capital of Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I think is a great line. Very much. Because you instantly know that bit, you, you know, it's CD, you know, CD agents and... Yeah. Bleh, you know? <laughs> and it reminded me a bit, almost like an American version of Ramsey Campbell. Who, who, yes. who sort of did the same again when we covered Cold Print, I think, which With is set print. in sex yep. shops and seedy, horrible, real grimy yes. urban settings. Uh, yeah, it's interesting because I've always put them, these two stories, Fat Face and uh, Cold Print, in the same sort of bracket. Nice. Uh, nice. Yeah. There's a, there's a couple of others. There's, a, there's a one by Gary Meyer. Uh, is it Gary Meyer? Uh, yeah. Uh, called Horror Show, which is a similar one. Right. Uh, set, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of set on the fringes of the '80s goth scene with the sort of you know your sex shows and all. That oh right, kind of I'll have to business. find that one out. Yeah, a lot of Caitlin R. Kiernan stuff is very yeah. similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, there, there's been at least one book of sort of Cthulhu erotica, if I can put it that way. Was it Sex, <laughs> there has sex and there. Death? I, I think it might have been edited by Ramsey Campbell, actually, an anthology, possibly. Oh yeah, so, yeah. There's been a few. There's another one. There's, uh, there's, sec- there's one called "Sex of the Cthulhu Mythos," which I I keep meaning to pick up just out of curiosity because on the front it's got like a, a cartoon of your little your stereotypical little flasher <laughs> with the jacket, and he's opening it. <laughs> tentacles coming out. <laughs> it's just like seventeen breasts and some tentacles. Like there's something about something about it. I don't, I don't, even if it's crap, I think I need it for my shelf. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we are completists, if nothing else. Yeah. Exactly. This is it. This that is goes it. in the, uh, the the special collection. <laughs> yes, the special collection. Yes. If any <laughs> listeners out there have any other uh, recommendations for us along the Cthulhu uh, Mythos Erotica line, then please do let us know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Via Dagon Sack. Day on sack. <laughs> yeah. oh. Just to tie it all together. There we go. Yeah. So Michael Shea was born in 1946 in LA. Uh, he studied at UCLA in Berkeley and he travelled around quite a lot. He was a prolific traveller in his early days. And it was while on his travels in Alaska, he found and read a copy of Eyes of the Overlord by Jack Vance. Mm. So he decided he was going to write uh, a sort of homage to that. Uh, that was called A Quest for Symbolists. Yeah. And this just amazed me because he, he actually sent it to Jack Vance, who approved of it, and it became part of the, the Die on Earth canon. Mm. Though I think that changed a little bit later on when Vance wrote some more Die on Earth novels. But Vance approved. Now, that to me is like, uh, I don't know, I found a Shakespeare play, so I'll write a Shakespeare play, and Shakespeare says, yeah, that's good. I mean, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. That would, must be like, blimey, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's like the opposite of what happened to Derleth, wasn't it? With his what became Solar Ponds. He wrote all this, all this Sherlock Holmes fiction. Went to the Conan Doyle estate, and they told him to basically told him to do what basically. <laughs> it's like, so, so quite rightfully, Derleth was like, "Oh, screw you! I'll just change the names a bit." Oh, well, yeah, I didn't know that. I yeah. didn't know they, they were. Yeah, that's where Ponds. Solar Solar Ponds came. Wow, yeah. that's interesting. <clears throat> he actually intended them as as to carry on. Right. With Sherlock Holmes, but the, the Conan Doyle estate just basically said no chance because they weren't letting anybody do anything at that point. Yeah. I suppose, in a sense, that's a bit like the Tolkien estate, right? Which have been yes. very. Well, Christopher Tolkien's passed passed away last year, I think, mm-hmm. but yeah. um, very protective. And uh, you can understand I think that. You get it. To, yeah. to an extent. Yeah. Especially with something as detailed as Tolkien. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's understandable. Mm. But yeah, to write a Vancean book anyway, because Jack Vance to me is, is pretty much top of the tree when it comes to uh, fantasy writing. Yeah. Just the, the the skill that he writes with and the language he is. I think him and Clark Ashton Smith yes. uh, are yeah. my favourite authors in that aspect. Yeah. It's interesting as well because uh, after that he did... He basically he, he switched gears and he went for another another native californian who we've covered before mr fritz Leiber. yes he did the nifteline yeah, yeah. didn't he and all that kind yes of, yeah. yeah very sort of gray mouse which is very gra- yeah. vapid gray mouser sort yeah. of stuff yeah but again he, he puts his own stamp on it it's not yeah. it's not just like a slavish sort of copy it's not like no. a, a tribute band kind of thing is it no you know? it's not it's not what you call pastiche it's more homage yeah, yeah. Yeah, which yeah, I guess yeah. is you know, it's kind of the kind of the kind of the difference between sort of like, as we covered before, Derleth, who was very much into pastiching Lovecraft, yes, and then what Shay did, yeah. which was his own take on it, 
and say what Campbell Ramsey Campbell did as well. It's their sort of their own sort of stamp on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, and because it's like Derleth, he, he almost has a tick list of tropes and things he has to get in. So you have to get all now Sprecher and Colton. You have to get the Necronomic and the, all the have to be in there. That has to be in. Has to be in there. Yeah, yeah. Literally, it's like some of some of it. Yeah, there's some of it is like it is literally a shopping list. You will list all the tomes, all the deities. It's, it's like I've, I've said before, I would love to, for the Durlith estate to let me go back and re-edit it because some of the stories are really, really good. Oh, he's got they're some just, good stuff. They're just buried under all this, yeah. you know, they, they, this this shopping list. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like when he gets it, it's like as it went along and Arkham House put out more releases, these shopping lists got even longer because he started listing all the <laughs> Arkham House releases as well. <laughs> Perhaps it was like you, you know, as a writer yourself, have you got to hit a certain word count, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can, I can get five hundred words just out of listing mythos tomes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe, but, maybe. But it's like, I, don't, I never have that problem. I have the opposite problem. <laughs> <laughs> what was the? Uh, it was the the Barbara Cartland character. Was it in Little Britain or one of those shows? Yes, it was. It was. It was little. Brilliant, yeah, wasn't it? and obviously she's got yeah. the hit the word count. So she, they, uh, what was it? They went tobogganing down the slope. We. Yeah. <laughs> How many words is that now? We. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe yeah, that's what was maybe. going on. Perhaps he, he was paid by the word. Can you imagine being a typesetter in those days? And you must get that, and you think, oh Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to get them all right as well. What a job. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Anyway, back to Michael Shea. Now, he did the same thing with Lovecraft as well, right? Because mm-hmm. 1984, he did The Colour Out of Time. Yes. Which yeah. was a sequel to The Colour Out of Space. Yeah. And again, very well written. Indeed. Obviously yeah. Lovecraftian, but his own take on it. Yeah. And he did several mythos tales. That there's been some collections, Copping Squid and other mythos tales yeah. is uh, the major one. Uh, the the one that, that I've got now is actually it came out not long ago from Dark Regions Press. It's a uh, demiurge, the complete right. Cthulhu mythos tales. Yeah, uh, edit. It's got edited by S T Joshi Yoshi. So you know you <laughs> you know nice. what you're getting there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Linda Shea is uh, sort of curating his legacy and mm. uh, actually reissue reissues. A- yeah, they've just released Mr. Canihan, haven't they? Is that Hippocampus Press, I think? Is, yeah, is, Hippocampus, uh, yeah. which is a, a, a novel he wrote but never released. Yeah. Uh, and it's sort of uh, influenced by The Hound or something. Yes, it is, yeah. I think I, it is, I've actually, I've actually yeah. got it yeah. on order yeah. from Amazon at the minute. <laughs> so, and, uh, yeah, we'll yeah. put a link up to the uh, official website because there is a lot of stuff going on there. Mm. On that website as well, there's some interviews with him and, and other things, some YouTube clips. So that's a mine of information. Because Shay did pass away in 2014. So uh, he, he died fairly yeah. young, I guess, which uh, is obviously sad. He did, Probably yeah. his well-known story in the mainstream, if I can put it that way, is the autopsy from uh, 1980. Mm. Um, we won't talk about that now, but we will cover that sometime. That's a, that's no. a real excellent horror story. That, that really is a good, a good one. one. Yeah. And I think, as we've said, with his mythos stuff, he very much said it in the modern day. And it's quite an interesting move away from the Lovecraftian protagonist or... I guess if we go back even to the M.R. James or those people, it, it's generally a sort of bookish type person, isn't yeah. it? A scholar. Your dusty antiquarians. Yeah. And learned scholars and men in tweed. Yes, yeah. men in tweed. Here we're getting... Well, if the men are wearing tweed, it's probably going to be like a tweed jock, jock strap with lots of buttons jock strap. on it. <laughs> ah, yeah. Turned inside out. <laughs> tweed bondage slacks. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, we're very much into the world of sex workers and pimps and yep. uh, street people and drugs mm. so very downtown very seedy but very evocative oh yeah and as we'll see the way he fits the mythos into this just works beautifully doesn't it it really does it really does yeah yeah it opens with a uh, patty uh, who's our main character uh, she's t- basically taken time off from doing uh you know her uh, <laughs> her job you know the oldest profession she's a uh, she was a uh, uh, basically i guess you'd say a high class prostitute that's kind of she took some time off because she had a bit of a, a breakdown which uh, i'll go into in a minute but she's gone back to working where she started out which is the lobby of the parnissus hotel nice name nice yeah. name it is isn't it which which actually crops up in a couple of um 
Shay's stories. Right. Right. Parnassus. Yeah. It's all, all it's uh, yeah, a lot, some of his stuff, it all takes place in the same sort of area. I guess it's all down by the strip, you know. Yeah, and, and again, yeah. this is in the 80s before the place got gentrified and it's still got that... Uh, yes. I, I was going to say yeah. old-style charm, if that's the word, but I'm sure people people will know <laughs> what I mean. Yeah. But it, it was a little bit... It, it, a little like Soho was over here before yeah, before it all became yeah. coffee shops. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. there, there was a yeah. certain danger in those places, but also they, they were vibrant, you know? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if the same could be said of this area at that time, but... Um, yeah. There, there, there was something about it. There was something about it, and I quite liked. Well, not liked, if that's the word. She's back at work in the hotel lobby, yeah. Which she thinks is quite good because it's a step up from working in the streets. Yes. Uh, and we get right into the grit of this because when you work in the streets, you have to put up with beatings, yep. people not paying you, and, a, a, and, and this, the, this the one. Quick... I, I know exactly what you were going to say because I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the quick Coca Cola douche behind some trash cans in an alleyway, which is yeah. just, I mean, how much how, how grimmer do you want? You know, that's yeah, really it. I know. It's just like he knew. I, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I'm. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it, it did remind me. There's a song by a band called The Fugs, who are a, a favourite band of mine, sort of yep. '60s American band called Coca Cola Douche. So maybe I'll put a link up to that in the show. Oh, do it! Yeah, do know. it! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like the fact that the, the, the like before before she took her time off, she was working at a massage parlor, which um, <laughs> called the Encounter, of which a <laughs> pimp was a part owner, but. Um, he insisted that the parlor beat was a, like a bit vacation to her because it was strictly a hand job operation. Oh, rub and tug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then she go, it goes on to d- discuss why she was traumatized. And uh, yeah, she's basically got a towel on some bloke and is uh, giving him the, uh, the five knuckle shuffle. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and there's this great little thing because this happens a couple of times in the stories. A big fat cockroach appears mm. and she looks into its beady eyes. Yeah. And for some reason she sees this guy's imminent demise. She yeah. Yes. Basically, yeah. Yeah. she sees this guy getting his head blown off. Yeah. And lo and behold, a couple of hours later, it's it kind of implied that it was his pimp or sort of her pimp or some of his cronies because they you know they rolled the johns as you yeah, know the, the yeah. term goes uh yeah in an alleyway poor sod gets robbed signs over some traveler's checks gets his head blown off yeah and she sees the photos i think right and that's what yes. sort of tips are over yeah she sees it in like a it's a two-page article or something in the in the paper or something yeah, she yeah. yeah. And there's yeah. this sort of thing we get later on as well, where none of these deaths they're they're noted and they're reported on, but they're not particularly investigated because it's just, you know, yeah. it's just low life. So who gives a shit? Is the is the implication? Yeah. And the the other nice thing in this was the room she's given the guy this hand job in, mm. uh, this tiny little cubicle. Yeah. With um, uh, the puked on carpet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. You, you can, yeah, you just cringe reading it. You're there, aren't you? You do, yeah. It's like whenever you see any of these kind of, the kind of films that go to these like adult bookstores and things like that, you get an image in your head. You know that down the road there's going to be uh, something with a load of little waist high holes cut in the wall, isn't there? Oh, <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it is just so seedy and mm. so down market. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the obese cockroach. I mean, whoever heard of an obese mm. cockroach you know but you you can visualize that and yeah. she, she has some sort of connection with it which is yeah very, which is very strange and that, that's the first sort of foreshadowing that something's really really weird is going on around this poor lass mm. uh you know she's got some kind of weird connection with this bloated cockroach uh, and it, it's like to me to my mind because it is you know it's a fat cockroach and it's also told talking before about the the carpet that's been puked up on is that why it's fat? Oh, oh. oh I never thought of that. That's yeah. horrible. That's horrible. <laughs> yeah. And and well, and bloated as well is something we get a lot of later on, right? Very much so. Yeah. 
yeah. Is is there a, a sense? Perhaps is this some sort of uh, scout for for Fat Face? Well, this is, this is what I thought. I mean, because because there is always the, you know there's running through it. There's these creature, these you know things, and they're always kind of desc- described as bloated. Mm. And the, so is the cockroach. So it's kind of yeah. like... Mm. Is there some sort of link? Those are his little spies or emissaries out in the world. I don't know. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so uh, after this, Patty, you know, she's uh, she's off for a bit. And then <laughs> I, like, I like this. Um, with hosp- the hospital Xanax just fading from her system, <laughs> she decided that the best therapy was the, to go back to working in the lobby of the Parnassus. Yes, which is strange, isn't it? Because um, it's like this is almost like her sort of she's happy with what her place in life working here. Because it goes on to describe that you know she fe- she feels because she's a local girl, she grows up there. These are her people. This is her community. She's never sort of had aspirations to be anything more. Which is kind of the kind of nice but weird in, in the same breath. It's, it's it's a very interesting character because she does mm. try. She's obviously a sort of uh, nice person at the core. Yes, and she builds this illusion of the community around her. She's yeah. She always has a cheery word with the guy at the drugstore that she's buying a uh, deodorants and douches from. De- and, deodorants yeah. and things off. Yeah, yeah. And there's the newspaper vendor and all yeah, this. Yeah, who, who, who comes in later on? Yes, isn't he? yeah. Okay. And uh, the, she's always chatting to the staff in the coffee store. But then you, you get this switch. Uh, so the, the, the waiter in the coffee store, you see her from his view. Mm. And she's just some hooker in a halter top. And, you yeah. know, and he's just like... Ugh. 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 So yeah. she's trying to desperately get these connections and this sense of, oh, I live in this wonderful place. I suppose it, it's a form of self-defense, maybe. You know? Yeah, it's like a comfort blanket, isn't it? It's got a sign of self-deception to keep you comfort, I think. You know, it's. Uh, uh, I guess. I guess we we all do it to a degree. We kind of go, ah, oh, this place ain't so bad, you know. Yeah. At least, at least the ceiling, at least it's not leaking, and the <laughs> windows haven't fallen in. You know, it's all right. At least we've not got cockroaches. <laughs> yeah, and he's got bloated cockroaches. <laughs> yeah. Is that a bad name? The bloated cockroaches. Bloated maybe. cockroaches. Maybe. Yes. Man. It's on. Yeah. It's possible. But then also we have this thing that we're told she's lazy. This was another interesting idea about her. Yes. That she is quite happy to let other people guide her in life and tell her what she did. In fact, she's happiest when yes. she's being told what to do. Uh, she doesn't have to make any decisions. Yeah. That's why yeah. she likes her pimp is because he's, he's uh, you know, he works out her schedule. She doesn't have to worry about anything. Yeah. It's quite sad, really. It is, isn't it? It's kind of like like uh, the old Nine Inch Nails song, Happiness in Slavery. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. you know, which is about the same kind of thing. Yeah. So, <laughs> and um, Devo as well. Freedom, Devo, of, freedom yeah. of choice, freedom from choice. It's, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 very much, yeah. And it's through this sense of community and uh, she's there and she's talking with her friends and she's all kind of like happy and all the rest of it. It's where we meet, you know, the second sort of main character in this story. <laughs> uh, he's a chap known only as Fat Face. Now, Fat Face works, he's, works, he lives in the building across the road and he's got two businesses, uh, one of which is a hydrotherapy pool and the other one is like <laughs> an animal shelter. It's like a dog pound. Pet, pet, pet refuge. Pet refuge, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, which is it's just like you know instantly you got this. Hey, what? <laughs> what? It, it is, but then in our minds you kind of mm, put those two together, two, and two right? together, yeah. And you're thinking, yeah, especially when we get the description of his clients. <laughs> yes, yeah, but I like this uh, this description of Batface here. Batface himself, they had no other name for him. Was often at his high window, a deer. Ruddy, bald countenance beaming avuncularly down on the hookers in the lobby across the street. His bubble baldness was the object of much lewd humour amongst the girls and pimps. Fat face was much waved down sarcasm, whereat he always smiled a crinkly smile that seemed to understand and not to mind. Patty, when she sometimes waved, did so with pretty sincerity. Yeah, I like this, that he's sort of a figure of fun 
to everybody else. But because she's got this kind of like feeling and all the rest of it, she's really sort of taken pity on this this chap. Well, she concocts a whole backstory for him, doesn't she? That oh, perhaps, he does. perhaps his yeah. wife died and now he's living his on wife his died, own. And, he nursed her and all the rest yeah, of it. She's, she's yeah, she's got this whole thing going on in her head. And this, I don't know, did you ever see a film called Hardware, which I think was... Oh, I did indeed. It's one of my favourites. <laughs> Iggy, Iggy Pop and everything, yeah. Which I think the Lemmy's in it as well. Yes, <laughs> like, yes. I mean, any <laughs> film with Iggy Pop and Lemmy has got to be worth watching, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Got a cameo from Ministry as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, they did, yeah, the, a lot of the music. Yeah. And there's the character in there who is spying on the lead actor. Yep. And he sings that song, the Wibbly Wobbly song. The Wibbly Wobbly song. Oh, man, I forgot about that. Yeah, I just thought if you go back and look at that and think Fat Face, you know, I don't know if there was any connection with this story or anything else, but you really get that sense off of that character watching this woman through his telescope. And, well, when you see it, you'll understand. We'll put a link up to the the clip in the the notes. That's what I I love that. I need to watch that again at some point. Yeah, we we should cover that. We should cover that. Yeah, we should. (laughs) And we we get the same sense from the uh, the clients at the hydrotherapy clinic. They describe as uh, waddling pachyderms, wobbly bulks, and quite... In a sinister fashion, a lot of them are bringing animals with them. Yes. But they don't look like pets. They look more like strays. Yeah. The animals don't want to be with these people kind of thing. But the, but I like the fact that, it, that he describes that the fact that these, these large blubbery types are pretty much just dragging these poor bloody animals without really, you know, without caring. They, they're oblivious to their struggle. Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? Mm. So, mm. Yeah. So Patty, uh, after after this, it goes. She goes out on a bit of a bet, an afternoon bender with Sherry, who's her her best friend. Yeah, they decide to take the uh, the sort of uh, take the day off kind of thing, and uh, basically go down on a, go out on a bit of a bender. And while they're at, while they're there, they're down in the uh, getting the booze down them and all the rest of it, she, they start to talk about old fat face, and she, and. Uh, and the two guy, girls sat trading yo mamas and boasts and dares. Then it just popped naturally out of Patty's mouth. So why don't you just go up and give old fat face a lube? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, and she, she's quite sort of for this, isn't she? Mm. She feels this sympathy for this person, as I say, she's concocted this yeah. story for. And, and it turns into a fantasy kind of, like, yeah, why not? of going up and, yeah. you know, he'd be so grateful and all this yeah yeah which kind of gets it goes back into a thing of like wanting to do something good for the community it's sort of a twisted way is going up and uh you know yeah, yeah. getting his rocks off L- kind of lubing yeah. up yeah it's a public service exactly there you go it's a public service <laughs> 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 don't get that on your rates on your, no, your council God, tax no. <laughs> so once they've once they've uh imbibed quite a lot and they're leaving they've worked themselves up into such a sort of giggling stupor about this whole idea that it that, that, that it's now become a dare and they're basically they're, they've decided they're both going to go up and they're going to you know give him a good old seeing to yeah yeah so they reach the building and they go inside and they go up to the fourth floor and uh and there's a strange atmosphere which Patty describes as almost like being under under the sea. Yes, that was an interesting little line. It's a good line, it? isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and she starts to, you know, chicken out. Yeah. Uh, Sherry being the more sort of direct and forceful of the two, it sort of calls her out on this. Uh, but then she kind of chickens out herself, but she takes a, a bit of paper and she writes a note which is never explained what she writes in it. You, you never know what's on it, do you? We don't know what no, was written. We on never it. know what was written, but we could kind of, kind of get a kind of impression that it's sort of like contact details, maybe, considering what happens later. Is it Sherry has been known for playing pranks and that kind of stuff? So yeah. you can imagine yeah. it's all, you know, my friend really fancied you or something along those lines. And Yeah, exactly, because, and, uh, yeah, because Sherry was sort of played pranks and she'd swapped... Uh, her address with Patty's address yeah. for a client or something. Yeah. That is possibly explains what happens later on, doesn't it? To share it. Exactly. Guess, yeah. 
yeah exactly that's what i'm thinking it's kind of so yeah so again i love that kind of thing where they don't actually spell it out yeah. but you, you you get the implication of what's on the note and uh she's sachet i like the fact she sachets down the corridor you know giving it the wiggle <laughs> uh and then slips this note under the door and then they leg it you know it, it, it's almost like school kids isn't it it is like yeah yeah it's like almost like playing knock and run you yeah. know kind of thing so they leave much much amusement is had and all the rest of it but these yeah the great line jesus it was like being under the ocean or something in there wasn't it and was there a, a, a sense of music being played or a faint idea of music yes there, that was it the faint fluting piping yeah yeah which if you've read mountains of madness you'll already be because the uh, it actually starts with a quote from mountains of madness doesn't it yes yes we get that quote which mentions the the shoggoths don't we at the very start it does yeah they were infamous nightmare sculptures even when telling of age-old bygone things for shoggoths and their work ought not to be seen by human beings or portrayed by any beings so that kind of sets up the whole story in a sense but uh yeah well, well we'll get to talking about what shoggoths are later on yeah. perhaps so we'll <laughs> this note kind of pays off because then we get this scene with arnold the news vendor right yeah who uh who later on gives uh gives patty a, an envelope with a letter in yes yeah and 50 bucks i think i think there's, there's some money as well yeah something like that it's um yeah but again he's his description is quite telling uh, there was a babyish fatness and redness about every part of him. All, over all his red, ambling softness, there was a bright, blackish glaze of invertebrate filth. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this isn't a very nice sort of chap. And uh, he bumps into them in the street. He sort of accosts them, uh, and it's uh, almost threatening. Patty sees it as almost sort of threatening, which is strange. Uh and Arnold raises his hand, pinched between his smudgy thumb and knuckle work, an envelope and a $50 bill. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And a ma- basically his thing is, a man said to read this. Now, yes. and we're, now we go into one of my favourite parts of the entire story. <laughs> Shoggoth poetry. Oh, isn't this amazing? It's, it's this incredible. Amazing? <laughs> it's just incredible. It's the... You know, it's one of those things you never knew you needed in your life. You never yes. knew you needed shoggoth poetry in your life until you read this yes. story. <laughs> it opens. Yeah. I mean, and it's interesting because he is telling them what he is. This this is what fascinates me about this. This yes. is like Dracula yeah. coming in. Uh, well, I think there are some parallels with Dracula here anyway because we've got this Arnold. He's like the Renfield character, perhaps. Yeah, he is like a Renfield character, isn't he? Yeah. And oh, the bugs as well. Oh, yeah. the bugs, yeah, yeah, yeah. The bugs. We yeah. have this sort of seductive element yeah. going on. But it's like Dracula turning up saying, hey, I'm a vampire, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. So, yes. Dear girls, how does a Shoggoth lord go wooing? You do not even guess enough to ask. Then let it be asked and answered for you. As it is written, the Shoggoth lord stumbleth unto his belusted. Lo, he cometh heavily unto her upon alien feet. So we're already a little bit like, yeah, I'm not sure I like the sound of this very much. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so he's told them he's a Shoggoth Lord, but then he explains what a Shoggoth Lord is or where they come from. You cannot imagine the Shoggoth Lord's mastery of shapes. His race has spread smaller since modern man last met with it. Oh, but the Shoggoth Lords are limber now. Supremist polymorphs, though what they are beneath all else is horror itself. But how is it they press their loving suit? What do they murmur to her they hotly crave? You must know that the Shoggoth craves her fat with panic, full of the psychic juices of despair. <laughs> Byron, eat your heart out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, fat with panic. Yeah. So there, there, there's another implication there. They sort of feed off of emotion, perhaps, as well, as well as this physical feeding. Yes. They, uh, yeah, they yeah. like They like their prey to be fully adrenalised and aware of what's going on, and uh, there's a psychic feeding as well. Yeah. Well, again, again we're like, the time that the, sort of this was written was when you yeah, had all the stuff about, uh, you know, all the myths about adrenochrome and all that kind of yeah. business. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're a cannibal, you want the person you're going to, you eat to be terrified because <laughs> yeah. it, you, you know? get all that in the, in the meat. 
Yeah, in the meat. It's yeah. so horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nasty, isn't it? That's what I love about this story. It's so beautifully grotesque. <laughs> but then it, it almost gets, if we can use the word romantic, <laughs> uh-huh. from a Shoggoth point of view, Yeah, your vow shall be the wash of blood that dims and drowns your dying eyes. You'll have for bridesmaids pain and dread. For vows you'll jabber blasphemies. My scalding flesh will be your gown and agony your bridal song. So it's um, yeah. it's a nice conjunction of, of romantic wedding day imagery yeah. with abs- absolute terror again. Yeah. You know? And then you've got that, that my favourite bit is the bit towards the end of it, which is, O oh, maids, prepare her swiftly, speedily her loins unlace, her tender paps anoint and bear unto my seething face. Oh. <laughs> Perhaps is never a good word anyway. No, it's not, is it? <laughs> this doesn't bring fear for her. No. This is the weird thing. It, it says the effect on her was more of melancholy than fear. Yeah. And again, if anything, it seems to make her more sympathetic. She thinks he must have been through so much pain and agony to write something like this. He mm. is deserving of sort of sympathy, if anything. Yeah. And she describes him as a hurt freak. It's strange, isn't it? Because um, cause Sherry, on the other hand, is kind of like, Ew. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, what the hell? So yeah, and th- so after this, uh, Sherry basically invites Patty over to her pad. And Sherry's got to go off and do, you know, take care of a client, and then so they 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 make a a, yeah, a date for. And I like the fact that it, it's again, it's got that sort of innocence because they describe it as a slumber party. Yeah, yeah, which is very sort of teenage thing. Which isn't is teenage, it? isn't yeah. it? Which is kind of how they've been acting all the way through, yeah. which is strange because you've got that sort of, you know, these girls acting with an almost innocence. Yeah. But the fact that they're, um, I mean, it's a dichotomy because they're like, they're obviously they're prostitutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're acting like, you know, it's strange. It's very, very, very good. And that's part, again, of perhaps this idea of arrested development of people who have undergone trauma remain at that emotional age when the trauma happened. Indeed. And also part of yeah. this blanket in themselves from the reality of this cockroach-infested uh, um, horribleness that they, they yeah, live it's in. It's, like uh, rose-tinted glasses to the extreme, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. In the following morning, she wakes up with... Uh, with no appetite and she's dawdling. It's like almost like life is kind of seeping through the cracks again. Yeah. Uh, and she shivered as if something crawled across her. So this again is that kind of... Is, is aware of her now, is, is forming this connection. Yeah. Like. So she goes and she's sitting on the... She, she goes and she's going to get a bus back to the Parnassus. You know, it's, it's the morning after the night before, which is always a bit of a bummer, isn't it? If you've had a good night and you've got to go back to work... <laughs> Especially if that's your job. Well, if that's yeah. your job, yeah, yeah. She was, um, she, she was. All, when she gets there and she's looking at this greyhound at the bus, and she's kind of like torn about like getting away. This to me was the saddest part of the whole story, in effect, because she's wandered around. Yes, she ends up in the suburbs with the nice houses mm-hmm. and the the neatly cut lawns and everything. Yep. The, the life life as it could be, and she all she's got four hundred dollars in her purse. Yep. So she's got the means to get on a Greyhound bus somewhere and get out of this. And yep. that's like, that's there's her escape. There's the exit. Yep. But then she sort of thinks, well, I'd have to pack. I'd have to get a bus ride. I'd have to get a new apartment, a new job. It's the line, isn't it? In the end, it was Patty's laziness that made her veer from this decision. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it's so sad because there she could have been away yep. and, and a new life. But she's pulled back in largely because of her own outlook. Yes. You know, it's not like the pimp turns up and drags her off the bus or anything like that. No. It's uh, back to what we said earlier. It's, it's basically she's they've got this sort of almost numb complacency. Yeah. That this is her lot. Yeah. Can't really be asked to do anything about it. Yeah. And this is also where we get this scene. That I'd, I'd actually forgotten about this when, from when I first read it. Oh, I love this bit, yeah. So she sees one of Fat Face's pet mm. vans, because this pet refuge he has, as a couple of vans that go out collecting... <laughs> yeah. Strays. Cats yeah. and dogs. And uh, she sees one of his collectors struggling with a... It sounds like a big dog, right? Because uh, It's a German shepherd. Right, so it... 
Yeah, so it's not the sort of dog you just go along and pick it up and put it in, in the van, no. right? <laughs> no, it's a walking great dog. But yeah. this guy, he's subduing it, or even sounds like he's sort of strangling it with no effort at all, mm. despite his appearance. And again, we've got this uh, bloated appearance, he's club-footed. Yeah. Uh, but yet he seems possessed of this almost inhuman strength. Yeah. Yeah, the thing he describes him as a lifting it off the pavement by the lead sort of thing. It's yeah, like, which is no mean feat for a German Shepherd, let alone if the German Shepherd is doing anything to you, right? Yeah, yeah. She sort of confronts him, but again, it's in this odd mm. way. If she goes, oh, oh, it's not my dog. I don't have a dog. <laughs> it's in this cheery sort of small town way. Yeah. And he turns to her, and I, I don't think he actually does anything to her, but we get this lovely phrase, she feels he's on the threshold of assault. Yeah. She she gets this real sense of danger from him. It's, it's this wonderful passage here. The collector began to smile nastily, and his breath came, foul and oddly cold, gusting against her face. Then something began to happen to his eyes. They were rolling up like a man's when he's coming. Well, they didn't roll white. They were rolling up jet black. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, and that's when the tax a taxi swings onto the street. Yeah, yeah. Now that 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 black eye thing, that's quite a trope these days. But I wonder if that was one of the first times it was used. I, yeah, I can't remember reading it reading it much before. No, uh, I think you certainly don't see it in Lovecraft. I can't think of a. Uh... No, I mean, um, like Shoggoth's eyes and things like that. Yeah, they usually orange in Lovecraft. Yeah. Three lobed and burning bo- eye. Three low burning eyes, yeah. yeah, that kind of thing. So that that whole black eye again, you see it a lot now. I mean, you can even get contact lenses. Yes, yeah, you can. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's become such an overused trope now. It's like every every because I play a lot of horror video games. It's like every horror video game, the the entity has got these black eyes. Yeah. It's just like, oh come on, can we have red for a change or something? Like that? <laughs> I suppose it's a it's a quick visual shortcut to say this isn't human, yes. isn't it? Yeah, really, yeah. it's. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, she jumps in the cab to escape. But then there's this other weird thing. She's going to go to Fatface and complain about that one of his employers has been abusive to her. There's mm. still this uh, naivety, I suppose. Mm. It's almost willful naivety, isn't it? It's not wanting to see the reality, wanting to believe the best in everything. Yeah. You know, because she's shaken up, she's freaked out. She decides against going and see, complaining and all the rest of it. Um you know, she's trying to, t- again, she's trying to tell herself, ah, it's, it's all in my head, there's nothing to worry about, blah, 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 blah. Yes. Um, uh, she phones Sherry up, and Sherry's kind of like, oh, I'm wrung out, you know, kind of thing. So she says, oh, go and get some sleep. Go and sleep then. And then Sherry says, oh, come over if you want, but I'm I'm knackered, so I'm probably not going to be great company. Yeah. You know, we've all been there. That's pretty much exactly what happens. And she gets there, and there's no answer. Mm. <laughs> and she she basically gets back to this sort of girlishness she decides she's going to spook her friend yes she's going to peek in through the window of this uh, stucco cottage I believe it's described as uh, yes yes a stucco cottage that was a bit tackier than Patty's I'm thinking it's more like a sort of prefab or mobile home type place or almost like a static caravan type thing perhaps you know yeah I uh, yeah this it was stucco I guess so like yeah like your sort of holiday homes that you yeah. get like yeah. your, chalet sort of thing. Yeah, your chalets. Yeah, your chalets. There you yeah. go. Yeah, your prefab chalet kind of business. There's a bunch of them just sprung up down, down the road. Actually, it's like, <laughs> where the hell did they come? Wasn't what, wasn't <laughs> that a, wasn't that an eighties band, prefab chalet, or was that something? <laughs> prefab chalet. Yeah. There you go. If, <laughs> if you're ever going to do a, a prefab sprout tribute band, that's what you can call it. <laughs> <laughs> prefab chalet. Yeah. And then you should be asking, why do you want to be in a pre-pass <laughs> It's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, so she goes, and basically one of the windows is slightly open, and uh, she she sort of leans in, and she, it's how, it's like she gets the impression that there's somebody in there with her, and she thinks that it that she's with a client kind of thing. And, then, and she describes a smell as well, which is kind of implied to be, you know... <laughs> the smells of the the the, the tantalising aroma of rumpy pumpy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, she she actually sees this, doesn't she? She she sees it's uh she looks in, 
and Sherry is on her back in bed and someone was on top of her and all, all she can see of Sherry was her arms and her staring round-eyed face and this horror this is horrible thing uh, her face stared round-eyed at the ceiling as she was rocked again and again on the bed yes uh, and and she just has a very quick look and more out of a sense of shame or anything she just looks away and walks off yeah and it, it, it's that being rocked and rocked again there's something quite disturbing about that phrase yeah yeah, so then um, when she goes back, she she basically decides she's going in. So that, you know, ready or not, one, two, three, I'm coming in, kind of business. Mm. And before she's fully in the room, her knees buckled because of a stench. Yes, a carrion smell. It's uh, really something overpowering, and uh, she, she almost passes out, right? With this. Fierce, damp rankness. Yes. Yeah. Then we get this incredible scene, which has two things about it. One, one is the description of the room itself, which is yep. like a uh, litter of wrappers and dishes. And I don't know, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen a place like that or been in it at some point. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody um, who's ever been a student. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know. So there's, that's the first horror, is that. The second mm. horror, but again, it's it's somewhat almost, but that's the sort of normal horror. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's that's yeah yeah. yeah. I like the fact that it's just it, that it's it's the everyday bits here. The TV on low was crowned with ashtrays and beer cans, while on the couch that it faced lay a freshly opened bag of Fritos. Yeah. So <laughs> one of my one of my nights in. Well, yeah, we, again, <laughs> you, know? you know, we've all we've all been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, front of the TV, can of beer, bag of crisps in your pants, you know. <laughs> quite a normal night in uh, mm. but then the real horror is in the bedroom where we're getting this this stench is welling out of the bedroom yeah and it's there that she finds sherry or as it turns out well the the remains of sherry let's, yeah. let's put it that way because she's sort of hanging out uh, like half out the bed and it's like uh from basically the very similar position as she was earlier when she saw her being rocked you know the arms and the the eyes and all the rest of it. And she goes to grab her and realise that it's, it's only the top half of her. <laughs> Again, it, it, it's kind of a thing, isn't it, that she realises that her friend is dead, but she wants to sort of uh, give her some dignity back. So she sort of pulls her out from under the bed, thinking I'll make her... Uh, comfortable is not the right word, but you know yeah. what I mean. Cover, Make but a decent course, cover her up kind of thing, yeah, which is a, yeah. a very, very sort of nice and very human thing to do. You know, you don't. Yeah. it's like, you know, if you, you, you found, like, your mate dead and he's stark naked or whatever, you wouldn't want people coming in you know you, you'd, well, throw, yeah, you'd, throw, you'd throw a sheet over them or I mean, yeah. a towel of you know protect their modesty kind of thing you know yeah basic basic respect yeah. isn't it yeah but yeah but what she pulls out is only about half of sherry yeah. she ends in a charred stump of rib cage and and it's oh that's the one and it it, again, it's the language. Yeah. It, it was not Sherry, but a dreadful upper fragment of her. Sherry's head and shoulders on one of her arms. Yeah. yeah. And he sort of describes her as like a broken doll, which I thought was a very, you know, evocative sort of phrase. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, obviously, this gets reported to the police. Oh, this this prompts another breakdown, right? She's back in the hospital. She's back yep. on the meds, because obviously this is uh, extremely traumatic situation for anyone let alone anyone who's already fragile mm -hmm. and um I, I kind of like this she she was phoning the detectives every day to find out what was happening yep but again it fits into this category of yeah it's a crime but it's you know it's not really a crime is it it's yeah not a, it's not a crime that we're going to spend any time investigating so as far as the authorities are concerned uh someone poured acid on her you know yeah that was it. this is what i was saying but right, when we discussed this briefly before we started it's like this is where you get that sort of feeling as it reminds me and feel this kind of bit with the police and how it's just like the horrors they see every day it's almost like a dirty harry movie or something like that yeah and uh i like the fact that, that he lists all the different pills she's on <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite you wonder if he had some uh experience of that i, I don't know too exactly. much about his life or no, or perhaps he certainly knew people. We, we know that he worked in hotels in LA, so he certainly would have seen yes. uh, all this uh, lifestyle playing out in front of him. You know. Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. yeah. 
It's, like, it's just a great line here. It's says, gorgeous technicolor tabs and capsules. <laughs> well, they are always it's like, it's, they are always brightly coloured, isn't it? Medication is always brightly coloured. It's true. Which is yeah. uh, I don't know if that's a psychological uh, thing or what. I'm sure it is. Yeah, I don't almost know. To remind you of like, yeah, take your sweets almost, isn't it? These are just sweets. Yeah, yeah. sweeties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, and obviously, again, she's gone through the same sort of cycle, come out of it. She wants to go back and carry on her life at the Parnassus kind of stuff. Uh, so she's walking down there, but, uh, but there's a snag before she reaches the lobby. And it's a great line. For Arnold from his wooden cave, through a leer of wet intensity that scared her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was speculation in his look. Now, and this is where you get the impression that he knows more than perhaps he's, <laughs> you know, he's letting on. Yes. Well, this this is like the Renfield character again, right? Because he, he gives her a warning, doesn't he, as well? Mm. Uh, when, when she decides to actually visit Fat Face, yeah. he's sort of, there's still a spark of humanity in him, perhaps. And yeah. You, you wonder, what's, what's his thing? Um, I don't think he's one of the Shoggoths, but is he like... No. Uh, but I think he, yeah, almost like a familiar, I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah like a servitor. A or servitor, like a, yeah. Weren't, weren't they called ghouls with that? Wasn't the technical term like a ghoul, a, a, a vampire servant was called a ghoul yes. at one point? I yeah, think. yeah. They were still human, but changed. Mm. Yeah, like Renfield with his buggy. Mm. Yeah, and uh, she t- basically she does what you do in that situation, <laughs> nectar cup of all Valium. And drug. <laughs> 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 well, there's a, there's a great bit here because then, he he gives her like some gifts, which are obvious warnings, but cryptic. And one of the things he gives her is a copy of <laughs> at the Mountains of Madness. <laughs> so there's a bit of fourth wall breaking going on here. Yes, it's interesting. So we're in a world where Lovecraft is real, mm-hmm. and the stuff he's writing about is also real. If you know what I yeah. mean. Which yeah. is like that's the Durlethian way of doing it. Mm. Which is strange because not many other pe- other authors have gone down that route, uh, mm. but that's that's the Durlethian thing because it's always you know like I was saying earlier about the uh, about the shopping list. It's always a, a copy of The Outsider and Others by H.P. Lovecraft from Arkham House Publishing. <laughs> <laughs> that was just advertising. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think Link Carter did copy. it as well. Actually, I think. Uh, I seem to remember Lynn Carter. I think seem to remember that Lovecraft was alive in Lynn Carter's uh, mythos as well. Well, there there have been some stories with them as protagonists. Actually, we should do an episode on that. Mm. Um, there's another one I've just seen, Robert E. Howard, um, set in Transylvania, I think, or the Carpathians. I think it's called A Cowboy in Carpathia. Oh, I don't know that one. No. Yeah, I just saw it the other day. I think it's a new release, so I'll, I'll investigate further anyway. Nice. Well, then we get to the denouement. Indeed. Because despite all these warnings and despite everything else, she decides that she's going to go and visit Fat Face. Oh, mm. I think the room she's got in the hotel is directly opposite his window, right? Yeah. She took a third floor room in the Parnassus for the night for the simplest of efforts, like calling a cab. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, directly opposite Fat Face's window. So they yeah. start this sort of flirting, as she describes it, across the across the space between. Yeah. And uh, that's when she makes the decision to go. Well, does he beckon her? He beckons her, yes. Is, is, is it? Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she's kind of in the window doing the... I mean, it's almost like the silent movie thing, isn't it? The silent movie heroine, you know, flicking the hair back in the window kind of yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know. So again, the question is: Is there is there an influence on his part? Has she already been snared in his web, mm. or is this totally her own idea? How, how much of it is coming from him, and, and whatever? Yeah, and how much of it comes right all the way back? Was the connection made by the fat cockroach? Maybe the, maybe the, it's the, the maybe it's the fat cockroach all along. Maybe he's the, he's the villain. <laughs> he's the kingpin. He's the kingpin. <laughs> You never know, you know. It could be. Yeah, could yeah, be. yeah, yeah. And this, I have to say, it's um, probably the one of the most disturbing scenes in Lovecraftian <laughs> literature I've ever read. <laughs> it is a, a masterpiece of the the vile. <laughs> I can put it, it that really, way. It really is. On several levels. Yeah. Well, first of all, we get the description of Fatface himself close up. 
Oh yeah, because uh, just before she actually goes up, Arnold again tries to uh, warn her off. Yes. But then Arnold looks up, and Fat Face is glaring down. Yeah. For the yeah, first time yeah. in it, his face isn't a happy, jolly. So he knows what's he knows what's going on, right? That's he knows what's going on. Yeah. He obviously knows what's going on. He was even grosser legged and more bloke bellied than his patients. It gave her a funny shock that did not change her amorous designs. He wore a commodious doctor's smock and slats. His shoes were bulky black and orthopedically braced. Such a body, less enkindled by spirit, might have repelled. (laughs) (laughs) And we get this, for me, which is one of the most creepy lines in this, was she somehow sees this figure as being kind and grandfatherly. Grandfatherly, yeah. Now, that sets up a very disturbing connotation to yeah, me. Which is followed up by a really disturbing line from Fat Face himself. My dear, you make an old fellow very, very happy. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there, there's there's mm-hmm. several implications there, I think, yeah. that, you know, we don't have to go into as such. but No, because it, it ties back into what we were saying about, like... Uh, like people staying at the part of their trauma, and there's obviously something there in her past. Yes, her, her wanting to, you know, it's almost like oh. childhood lost kind of stuff. Yeah, wanting to please people. And, yeah, we, yeah, I don't think yeah. we need to. <laughs> yes, just yeah. just draw yeah. a discreet yeah. veil over that now. <laughs> and uh, he shows her this big hydrotherapy tub. Right, he pulls back this curtain. There's this huge hydrotherapy mm-hmm. tub filled with black slime. Yeah. The noise of animals and churning water. Yeah. <laughs> animals, like yeah, yeah, is that the that's the pet thing? I Indeed. guess. Indeed. Right? Yeah. Uh... She finally conquered disbelief and realised the fact that she'd been struggling with all along. Those dozens of canine gurglings and cat shrieks were sounds of agony and distress, not hospital sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Torture chamber sounds. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Fat face turns up unbuttoning his smock and says a line that will just live with me forever. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead and peek out, sweet heedless trollop. Heedless <laughs> trollop. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Soon we'll all dine on lovely flesh men and women, not paltry vermin. Oh. oh. <laughs> so, yes, fat face and his shove off pals in their flesh suits have been basically... You know, the pets are food. Yes. That yes. makes sense now why the, the dogs were all going in there and nobody ever saw them again. Yeah, but this is not the sort of food they want. No. no. And we get this nice, horrible, horrible, nice, nice, horrible thing of under the smock, he's got this sort of suit that is just a mass of buckles. Yes. And he starts undoing these buckles and purple gel oozes out. Purple gel, a jellied mass, yeah. And yeah. It, it, it sort of flows into the tub. And this is where we get this really horrible uh, picture of all that's recognisable is his face. Yes. His face bobs in the simmer. We've got this (laughs) simmering purple gelatinous mass with his face in the middle of it. Yeah. And his face in it. Is it, which blade is it? Is it the first, I think it's the first blade, isn't it? You've got that, the first blade movie with Wesley Snipes, you've got that. Basically, you've got fat face. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> I never thought of that, but yeah, it is. Yeah, because he tortures it with a with a UV light to yeah. get information, and it's like a big vat with a, a blubber with just a like a, a face. That's it. It's the yes, it's the lamp. Yeah, yeah. It's got like a child. Uh, it's got like a a kid, like a little boy's voice, like when it when he's when he's burning it with this UV lamp to get info about that. Stephen Dorff, dude. Yeah, maybe another little influence there from Mr. Shea. Who knows? Yeah, definitely. That definitely would have blade would have definitely been made after. Mm. So yeah, and this description of palps rising, uh, uh, almost uh, sort of phallus like from this mass. Yeah, and of course they they grab her, and we get the music. The fluting is back, which again ties in with our mountains of madness connection, of course. Yeah, yeah, the the piping, which goes all the way back to well, Lovecraft got it from. Uh, uh, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket from uh, from uh, Poe, doesn't it? The Tekalili. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Tekalili. So you know, it's the yeah, it's the uh, the piping of Shoggoths, which is basically I 
I used it hundreds of times <laughs> in my stories. If you're going to do Shogos, you've got to have the unearthly piping. Oh, you've got to have some fluties going on you've in there. You've got to have some fluty going in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We were speculating before if these are like those sort of uh, thigh bone flutes, you know, rather yeah. than being your, your James Galway. This was some, uh, something much more sinister than Sorry. that. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, and then this horrible scene, the the end of the whole story is she is slowly lowered into the Shoggoth. Into Fat Face, like literally yes. into him. <laughs> literally into him. Yeah. And how uh, her shoes dissolve first. Yeah. And this idea of her feet, she sees her own feet spread out into the mass <laughs> it's like a, like a uh, melted candle isn't it it's this the, yeah, yeah melted yeah. cheese even yeah, yeah yeah coruscating i think he describes it yeah it's just a nasty image isn't it <laughs> yeah and this is the idea of the panic right because up to now she's been quite calm about this but at this point mm-hmm. obviously you're going to be full of panic and fear and terror and this uh this adds to the flavor yeah so again he repeats one of his lines of his poetry doesn't he Oh, yes, dear girl, you'll have for bridesmaids pain and dread. For vows, you'll jabber blasphemy. <laughs> yeah. And then it ends with a, yeah, the great, a great bit of light here. Till her feet and ankles spread nebulae of liquefying flesh within the shock of Lord's greedy substance. And her kicking slowed. And she sank more deeply. In. The end. What a lie to end on. There we go. Now. Yes. Yes. It's a, it's a tragic tale, isn't it? The, you know, this poor lass. It's very, it's very sad, mm. especially given that she could have escaped at yeah. that point, and she has this naivety or this desire for everything to be nice. Yeah. And clearly, there's very little that is nice about her life at all. She's got that friendship with Sherry. That's pretty much it. Yeah, but it's strange. What I like about it is that after, after Sherry dies, she doesn't even sort of entertain the notion that fat face has got anything to do with it and her obsession with him deepens then she she sort of she's it's sort of again it's almost childlike it's like she's looking for something to latch on to yeah she had sherry before now sherry is gone she's got to latch on to something else all she's got is this <laughs> blubbery shoggoth monster up in <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the avuncular shoggoth law yeah the, the yeah. avuncular shoggoth law now there's uncle shoggoth <laughs> Oh, that's, <laughs> that's the album name, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit then about Shoggoths. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously we have them as a, a servitor racing at the Mountains of Madness. Yep. And they, they pop up, I mean, in all across Lovecraft. Oh, yeah. They're mentioned in so many. I think they're one of the, the things that's mentioned the most. Probably Shoggoths and Yog sothoth I think, are the... The, the entities mentioned most in Lovecraft. One of his finest uh, inventions, I think. Oh, yeah, because it's implied after once that they rebelled with the Elder Things yeah. that they went to work for old Squidface. Yes. You know, help, they helped build Relay kind of thing. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's like, yeah. They're a great, great, great thing. And it, it's interesting to me, Fatface, because um, they've always been described as sort of like protoplasmic shape-shifting kind of blobs that can mimic... But in that, it's like they have a flesh suit, yeah. which is an interesting take this, on it. This was beautiful, what he did here, because there's a uh, fat face explained that um, they keep the face. So they've taken the form of the face, but mm. they don't change the face because people notice when a face changes. Yes. Anything from the neck down, as long as it's covered up and vaguely human-shaped, doesn't really doesn't draw matter. attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this idea, they're they're almost wear, wearing like um, a kind of mould, like a, a body mould, like a jelly mould or something. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like uh, it's almost like the Slitheen in Doc in Christopher Eccleston era Doctor Who. Yeah, you know <laughs> these alien blo- alien monsters that sort of shrunk themselves and fitted into skin suits. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And in in a way, it's classic alien stuff that the aliens take yeah it's almost like human. body snatchers isn't it yeah it's, yeah you know. but without that um well they're not aliens because they were here before us <laughs> no. yeah and it's implied that we are part shog off <laughs> really isn't it it's yes well, well i mean the result of some mistake in uh i mean that's that's something yeah. i used a lot 
was uh, they they were experimenting creating all these mm. different things and the the, the human virus mm. or the human subjects escape from the lab. Yeah, because I mean and, it's uh, always been applied that we come from the same place as Shoggoths, you know, from these star-headed elder things, sort of pissing about trying to yeah. <laughs> trying to make stuff. Yeah. And, and deep ones, deep ones, yeah. deep ones are kind of part of the same material because we have that whole idea of uh, uh, deep one hybrids, right? We know that deep ones and humans can mate. Indeed. So we're obviously the same. Uh, again, I'm not a geneticist, but we're. But it's it's back to the primordial slime, isn't it? Uh, which actually, an interesting one we could, we could cover at some point is actually Clark Ashton Smith's Uber Salpha. Oh right, yeah, we we did that. Yeah, yeah we we did. Oh, that. Have you already done that? Yeah, because uh, yeah, he's yeah. A, yeah the unbegotten source. Yeah, basically is the primordial slime. Yes, yes. yes. You know, it's all, you know. Mm. Yes, because that was all about regressing back through countless yes. lives to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is quite common in Robert E. Howard as well. That idea of yes, past lives and part memories, yeah. and we've all and uh, Belknap Long as well. Yeah. The, you know, because we had we had bits of that in uh, Hounds of Tindalos. Yes, yeah, yes, wasn't it that look back? Yeah, the look it, back through. They, they like, were they were beyond. I've lived like hundreds and thousands of lives all the way back to yeah, basically Uber Safala. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right, how the hell you pronounce it? <laughs> so yeah, it's quite a common theme, I guess. In mm. in this yeah. literature, but what I like he's done here is is, is updated them and they've developed. Mm-hmm. So if you had. I guess the way this would have been done before was it would have been an evil wizard in there and he yep. would have lured the girls in and fed them to the Shoggoth in the basement. Yes. That probably would have been the setup. Probably, yeah. But yeah. now we've got the Shoggoth himself. Be- because, again, they're not... They're presented as amorphous blobs and everything else, but they're intelligent. Oh, yeah, and they're constantly evolving. That's the whole point, is yeah. that the, the fact that uh, um, in Mountains of Madness, the point why they rebelled is because they'd... They've been mimicking and developing speech and all the rest of it, taking on attributes of their masters to the point where they surpassed them. Yeah, yeah. It's the evolution. You know, it's Darwinism in action, isn't it, really, <laughs> if you think about it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is what they've done here. They're, they can now mimic people to such an extent they can live in a city. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, in a way, it's easier for them to live in a place like that where... People in cities tend to turn a blind eye more, perhaps, to stuff that's going on. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't look at the homeless people. You don't look at the poor, you know, no, winos, whatever. You, you sort of step up around them. That's and... a theme that goes all the way through Shay's stuff. Mm. Like, these are the invisible people. Ramsey Campbell does a good line on it as well in a lot of his stuff. It's these, it's the sort of dregs of society yeah. that... The people like the police don't even bat an eyelid. It's just like, oh, it's just another dead. Okay. Well, exactly. That's what we see exactly in this. And, yeah, and in, exactly. In cold print, the guy who comes up to him, he thought was a tramp, right? He, he was going to have yeah. nothing to do yeah, with yeah. this guy. So, yeah. Yeah, th- this is almost like this veneer of civilization and sophistication with these things almost parasite like underneath, you know? Mm. Uh, and, and there's your cockroach again, right? Because you don't see exactly. you don't yeah. see cockroaches until you move the fridge, right? You have to, or you have to no, move the wardrobe, yeah. and then oh, yeah. you get that, the horror. <laughs> like, of, oh, where did you come from? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So perhaps in that sense, the shoggoth is like the cockroach in that they're virtually indestructible, uh, and they yeah. live with us but feed off of us. Indeed, and also the, the, there's also that implication, isn't there? Like with lines of madness and things like that. But like you say, they're indestructible. You're never going to get rid of them. Yeah. What's going to be left at the end of ten times? Shoggoths and cockroaches. <laughs> and Keith Richards. And Keith Richards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in the shadow out of time, it's a kind of implied that uh, you know because they take on forms that you know yeah. the yith take on the forms of like things all the way through and it basically implied that at the end times the only thing left are these sort of cockroach cockroach like bug things it is it is yeah the yeah. The, the last uh, masters of the earth if you want to put it that way or the last civilizations are uh, uh, huge beetle type things aren't they yeah yeah huge beetly cockroach yeah, things yeah, yeah. yeah so it's mm. quite yeah excellent mm. well i think 
for me, that's a that's a top ten mythos story, definitely. Same. Yeah, it's one it's one of my favourites. It's uh, one of my favourites that isn't by like Lovecraft himself. It's yeah, like that. I, 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 there's something about it. It's it's just so well written as well. Yes, and it, it's that lovely thing of uh, I say lovely again in a horrible way the the shogoth shogoth poetry. I mean, you know, like Vogon poetry, but it's um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's antiquated in style, isn't it? And even at the end, he calls her a trollop. You know, it's like trollop. sort of seventeenth century or something. Yeah, so. but that's what I'm saying. It's almost Byronic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it is almost like if Byron was an amorphous blob. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps that's the time they learnt to mimic speech patterns or something. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know, it's uh... yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, there's so many so many places you could go with that. Mm. Uh, which is getting why, why I mean that and Carl Print for me are two that re- uh, will always stick in my head because they're just such they, they make you think as well as go Ugh. grimy, yeah. <laughs> very grimy but very thought yeah mode. gritty and filthy and horrible yeah. and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think we both recommend anything by Michael Shea. Yes, really. if you haven't read the the Color Out of Time or any of the Nifteline books or the. I, I mean, they're just superb, superb books and stories. Yeah, and no, Copping Squid is another favourite of mine, uh, which is about, about like a liquor store robbery gone wrong. And, you mm. know, uh, so again, it's just very, 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 very different to a lot of the other Mythos stuff. But, yeah. I mean, it, actually, I would, would like Copping Squid to me feels almost like a continuation of what Fritz Leiber was doing with Our Lady of Darkness. Yes, that's a good point. We're in that same urban setting, aren't we? And, and, or, or... That, yeah, exactly. You know, and sick building syndrome. Yeah. And basically, you got that. Again, it's a hill, yeah. isn't it? it the, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's all weird. It's all great. Brilliant. So that's our first visit to Michael Shea. And uh, I'm sure we'll be returning to him in the future. Right. Yeah, I think, I think we'll have to at some point. Yeah. All right, well, the bus is going to be coming to pick us up soon. But before it does, there's just something we wanted to mention. And that was the sad news that Anne Rice passed away in December. Now, I think for both of us, she's someone who had a huge influence on our uh, our reading and our gaming lives. And um, a, well, a big influence on horror literature in general, I guess. Yeah. And um, from my and also from my perspective, being a you know a young goth in the nineties, it's kind of a you know it was recommended reading, wasn't it? And so yeah. she basically was a big impact on that and on the entire culture, goth culture, really. Well, she took the I guess up to then we'd had the standard vampire Dracula kind of gothic count castle kind of setting, but she brought it very much into the modern world and, and sort of everyday life. Yes. An, an interview with the vampire was a real game changer, wasn't it, I think? It really was, yeah. It was a, it was a, it was a superb, superb work. Yeah, I liked the film as well. I, th- I really enjoyed the film. I thought it's one of the few times I can actually get through a Tom Cruise film that I wanted to slap it. <laughs> <laughs> there was quite a lot of resistance at the time, I remember, to him being in it. I, oh, there was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like I say, most people, could, by this point, they couldn't stand him. <laughs> yeah, just... and I'm not sure if John Travolta was up for the role as well. Or I might be thinking of uh, The Doors. I, I think they, they uh... both possibly went for the role of Jim Morrison as well. I might be confusing the two, but... No, I'm not sure on that one, yeah. not sure, but that would have been hilarious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. John Travolta as the stat. That would have, have been worth watching, wouldn't it? Especially if he broke out his dance moves. Yeah, stack heels and, yeah, you know, yeah, white yeah. suit. Mm. I can um, see that, I can see that. I was surprised when I checked back that Interview with Vampire was actually published in 1976 as well. In, in my head, it was always an 80s book. Yeah, same, same. I, th- I think that may be because that's when it became sort of became popular yeah i think i think it i don't think it was like an overnight success you know like a like most books really it takes a while for them to sort of creep in yeah. uh yeah was what you were saying earlier was the vampire stat mid 80s that was 85 yeah well I, yeah. I think what happened was the interview with the vampire got a uh, it didn't get very good reviews at the time from critics. Mm. It was very poorly received. So I guess, like you say, it took time to build up some momentum and be yeah. discovered by, well, discovered by its audience, really. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly, yeah. Uh, which I guess was sort of 1980-ish, and then she wrote the, yeah. the, the, the sequel, I suppose. 
Um, yeah, well, I can I can see that. I can see why it didn't do so quite so well in the age of disco. <laughs> but by by sort of like you know sort of early mid when you know was sort of goth appeared with Joy Division in sort of late seventy nine or whatever. Yes, uh, yeah. you know. You know, by the eighties it was in full. By the mid eighties, it was in full flow, wasn't it? So it was, yeah. You know, it was begging for it, really. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, its audience kind of grew just after the book was done. I, I mean, obviously there'd be horror fans or you know fans of oh yeah, and I suppose to some ex- extent sort of uh, gothic romance fans as well. I mean, that's that's been a huge growth, isn't it? That particular genre. It has, yeah, yeah, yeah. G- gothic romance, paranormal romance, or whatever. Yeah. I can't remember yeah. what tag they actually. They keep changing the label on it, <laughs> but, but it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's sort, sort of Mills of like, and Boone you know, set in Transylvania and uh, <laughs> some of it. Pretty much. I mean, yeah. that, that sounds a bit disparaging, actually. I, I shouldn't be quite so... Uh, I'll I take that back. That's a little bit disparaging, but... Um. <laughs> to be honest, I have read some stuff that is basically like right. Bill's and Boone. <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about the good end of it here. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a spectrum for everything. It's like everything, yeah. isn't it? There's a there's a high end and a... And a, and a yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think I mean I, I don't know for certain but surely White Wolf were very influenced by this for Vampire the Masquerade which I know we both played as yeah. well We yes indeed indeed yeah they had to be they had to be I mean the, the whole way the, like the structure the sort of the hierarchy and the sort of the vampire class structure and everything is straight out yeah. of the yeah. Amrise vampire novels you know. And that was something that re- revolutionised gaming as well. I mean, I, I sort of think, you yes. know, I, I came on up on war gaming and then into Dungeons and Dragons, which was yeah. a certain type of role playing. And then we got Call of Cthulhu, which changed it again. Indeed. And then yeah. I think Masquerade was a, a whole new uh, experience, uh, very immersive. It was. I mean, uh, it, I mean, it's all it's pretty much LARPing, really. Yeah. It, like a yeah. lot of it. It's you know, it, I mean, the gag. That's maybe where LARPing came from. Well, again, there's certainly masquerade LARPing groups, aren't there? And it, it's more that theatrical yeah. element, isn't it? I suppose. Exactly. Yeah, it was. It was more more instead of sitting there with your stats and playing a character, it was more acting the character, becoming the character, wasn't it? Which is, you know, where LARPing kind of came from. Oh yeah. Well, we we, we used to play it by candlelight with moody music going and all that kind of stuff. That the setting was very important. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, we did it all. Goblets of red wine, brilliant, punk, nice. frilly shirts, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> bunch of punty gods. <laughs> is there any other sort? Well, no, actually, there exactly, is. exactly. There's quite a wide range of any excuse of to get me frilly shirts. Oh, on, yes. I'm happy. <laughs> Frock coats, candles. <laughs> Frock coats, frilly shirts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you can add in a little buffet as well, then I'm definitely there. So, oh know. god, yeah, 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 yeah. Some volavants and sausage rolls. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are the sad passing of Anne Rice uh, we'll raise the goblet to her memory I'm sure on, on hearing that news indeed indeed. well that just leaves one thing before we leave a cold grey and rainy Innsmouth it does indeed yes it's time for our first plunge of 2022 into Dagon's sack Dagon's sack Bizarre. <laughs> let me do you go. Let me heft it onto the counter. There we go. <laughs> oh, it's, it is bulbous as well, isn't it? It's bold. It's bulging this month for us. <laughs> so, what, what have we got? What, oh, we've oh, we, we got three letters. I, I tell Ooh. you, what, do you want to hand me those two? They look quite short. There we go. Yeah. Ah, right. So, <laughs> you might be, I don't know if you'll be <laughs> horrified. I found it quietly reassuring that even Dagon gets spam <laughs> <laughs> so we've actually got two spam letters to Dagon I wonder if these people really know who they're getting in touch with that's I have quite no a, idea there's quite a good story in there isn't there yeah perhaps? I think there is that's yeah a, yeah yeah yeah, just the inbox, the spam box of Cthulhu. Yeah, can... <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I love the name on this one. This is from a Mr. Barley Chumali, which I thought was great. 
<laughs> Something from Carry On Up The Jungle. Farley Chumali, isn't it? Wonderful. <laughs> Brilliant. And Mr. Barley Chumali writes, Deal One. Now, I'm not sure if he means old one or great one, but... Anyway, well, no. anyway, I like it. It's being reasonably formal to, to Dagon. Yeah. You know, it's a uh, dear one. Did you receive my previous mail waiting to hear from you soon? So the answer is no, Mr. Chumali. And you'll be waiting a while, I should think, to hear from Dagon. Yeah, I said. Uh... Or perhaps yeah. not. I don't know. He might be appearing in your dreams sometime soon. So. <laughs> Depends what the previous email was about, really, wasn't it? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We don't know where that went. Now, and the second one is just some, from someone called D-Captain. That's D-E-Captain. D-Captain. D-Captain. Yeah, which I thought nice. sounded quite Innsmouthian, doesn't it? To captain. It does, yeah. To, yeah. The captain is calling Dagon, and he asks, can you answer my calls? I try to contact you, but no response from you. Well, my advice to D-Captain would be keep on calling, because uh, we know that Cthulhu always calls back at some point. So. Yeah, hell yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just when they, yeah. <laughs> Reverse charges. <laughs> <laughs> So there we go. That's that's two spam mails, but we've got, we've got an actual real one as well. We do, we do. We've actually got a real one from uh, from Dave in West Bromwich, uh, and he asks, um, "So, uh, what is your favourite sort of vampire film, vampire literature?" Oh, that's a good one. Well, I suppose there's two very obvious answers, isn't there? We've just been speaking about Anne Rice, indeed. Yeah. So, Interview of the Vampire has got to be on yeah. any list for. For book let's, and just, film, let's just I pretend think. Queen of the Dam didn't happen. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't it, it great. Kind of, yeah, that had so much potential as well. It was a real disappointment to me. I was really annoyed about that. For a start, they got the soundtrack all wrong by mm. getting a like they did got the new metal bands at the time, people like Corn and stuff like that to do it. It's all sort of angry, yes. shouty stuff. It's like yes. no, <laughs> it should have been more like similar to the Crow soundtrack. It should have been proper. Yeah, you know goth stuff you know so i was really disappointed by that <laughs> well they had no excuse because at that time all that music was available wasn't it well, exactly I, I guess yeah. interview with the vampire maybe that movement where it was in an early-ish phase mm. i guess well, you know it was there i mean they used things like sympathy for the devil didn't they and, and stuff. oh that was great that was a great well. choice though that. i mean that's just yeah. a great song so yeah whether you're a fan of the stones or not it's just a cracking tune yeah Personally, I would have used the lie-back version, but uh, well, that's just me. All <laughs> oh, right, I've not heard that. Oh, it's that. great, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll look that up. Yeah. yeah. So that's that covers a, a book and a film. I mean, of course, the other obvious book is Bram Stoker, Dracula, mm-hmm. which, well, it, not, not the first, not the first vampire novel, but certainly the, the most well-known and the most widely yeah. read and the most influential. I, I, would. I believe the first one's probably the vampire, wasn't it? Polidori. Yeah, yeah. Which would have been well, I guess, around the same time as Frankenstein. I, I, I yeah, because it was it was all from that weekend at the the the, the lake house, wasn't it, where they decided to write a horror story? Yeah, yeah. That was uh, was it Lord Lord Ruthven, wasn't it? In that one, it was the vampire in that? I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Ruthven. Yeah. yeah, that's the one. But in terms of uh, books, I had a, I had two other choices. One was a book called Fever Dream by George R R R R R R Martin. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were going to break it to rah rah rah. It's what well, is this with authors and rah rah? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's rah rah. Just, just yeah. as a, a quick diversion, because it is a great story. I heard from a friend of a friend of someone who had convinced their kids that Tolkien's first names J R R R were Jolkin, Rolkin, Rolkin. <laughs> <laughs> But his name was actually actually Tolkien, Rolkin, Rolkin, Tolkien. <laughs> oh, oh, bravo! I like it. Well played, sir. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, bravo. Yeah. But yes, George R. R. Martin of obviously Game of Thrones fame. Uh, it's a book called Fever Dream, and it's set on a New Orleans uh, riverboat gambling boat. Mm-hmm. Really, really good story. So that would be one favourite. Cool. And the other one is a 1988 book by Barbara Hambly called Immortal Blood, ah. which I think in the States it was called Those Who Hunt in the Night. But I've got the, the UK version was Immortal Blood. 
which uh, is set in Edwardian London, yeah. where a private detective is hired to find out who's killing vampires. Oh, nice. That's a really nice book, really well written. She's an excellent writer. So, yeah, that, those would be my other books. Cool. I don't, I've not really read, it's weird, I've not actually read that much vampire stuff, but I think my favourites would probably be Brian Lumley's Necroscope series. Oh, yeah. They yeah. were they, they were great. Yeah. But they were really, really good because they were they were like my kind of vampires, you know. Evil bastards, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't go in for this twinkly, nicey nicey vampire. Twi- Twilight I, I like my, things, yeah. yeah, I like my I like my vampire to be a bastard, you know. <laughs> and I guess that's why like film wise, I mean like again, an obvious one. Uh I'm I'm just gonna say it. The best Dracula, it's gotta be Christopher Lee. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love the Hammer Dracula films. In fact, a lot of Hammer vampire films in general. I mean, Countess Dracula. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. That was a bloody good film. Um, there was another one. There was a proper exploitation film around that time called Vampires with a Y. Right. Uh, that was based on the sort of Carmilla thing. Uh, I can't for the life of me think who did it, but it, it bordered on soft porn. But was, it was, fr- really, was, that, was it a French one? Was that a French one, perhaps? I think so. I think it may have been, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was really, really good film. Really good yeah. film. It did, like I say, it did border on porn. So don't watch it like with your dad or something. But, <laughs> but, but, but watch it with your nan. But, uh, but it is a damn good film. And on the other end of that spectrum, like... Um, Another one that I love, even though it is not a great film by any mean, any stretch of the imagination, although I, I personally think it's awesome, is Vamp. All oh, right, right. With Grace Jones and oh, I've not seen that for years. But <laughs> no, yeah, it's a great film. It's like high camp. It's brilliant. I it's think like, I think that's just popped up on streaming as well quite recently. Yeah, so, yeah. That's that's due a revisit. I watched it again recently. It's a friend of mine, Callum, uh, Callum Pierce. He's a he's a big fan. And we were talking about it, so I had to watch it again. <laughs> it is it's a great film. I am uh, I agree with all those, though, though Vampire would have to re-watch again. But yeah, I remember it being a lot of fun first time round. When, when I came down to think that there's actually a huge amount of choice here. I mean, we're getting to like, you mentioned Hammer, Vampire Circus was another great one. Yeah. There's the, the Blade films. But I, oh, I've kind yeah, of narrowed yeah. it. I've narrowed it down to a few. I think top of the list for me is Murnau's Nosferatu. Yes, of course. I don't, know why I, I don't know why I didn't think of that <laughs> at all. It's, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I think it's because there is so much choice. You yeah, because I went down, I went down the sort of sixties and seventies rabbit hole. So I was thinking of things like uh, Roman Polanski, vampire, famous vampire killers. Oh wow. yes, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think for me, uh, Nosferatu, the the performance. Max Shrek, it, it still has so much power to freak you out. Yeah. Is it a performance? Is it reality? There you go. Yeah. Yes, yes it still looks so weird. Which then le- leads me on by way of that into Shadow of the Vampire mm. with uh, William yeah. Defoe and John Malkovich. Uh, again, that's the story of the making of Nosferatu. That is a great, it is a great film. It was one of those I went into with quite low expectations. Yeah. Uh, because at that point, they both both of those two actors had done a load of crap at that point. <laughs> so I was kind of like, oh, great. <laughs> uh, but they, no, it was really, really good, really strong, really strong film. Really great vibe. It captured the vibe of the original Lost for R2 quite nicely. I it did, did it? That, that is one we've watched a few times. That does get the DVD, just get dusted off every now and again for yeah. that one. Yeah. And I'm going to, obviously, we said Interview with the Vampire. Yep. Um, the first part of Bram Stoker's Dracula with Gary Oldman. I would agree. Second half. Yeah. <laughs> Second Not half, great. You know, it, it is what it is. It is, what is, it is but, but the first half of it is phenomenally good. Yes. That's one of the best p- portrayals of, of, of Dracula, I, I think. <laughs> Although I can't watch it without giggling because there's one bit, right, where Keanu Reeves in the, in the old handsome cab going along along the Carpathians on the road and he sees that blue flame at the side of the road and he goes, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, and for a second, Bill and Ted are alive and well and in Transylvania. Whoa. Red dude. As soon as he goes, whoa. <laughs> hey, it's that count dude. 
Yeah. <laughs> Willy, Willy, Willy. Oh, bless you. I, I do like Keanu. He seems like a really nice guy. Oh, I do as well. But I put it's just every now and then. It's like when he do, he shouldn't try and do accents because every it always slips every now and then, yeah. and the stuff yeah. a dude comes out. Yeah, that that was quite notorious for for it. That film. I mean, even Tom yeah. Waits, who I love in that, I, I find a little bit. Tom, just di- dial it back a bit, you know. <laughs> yeah, just wind it. In. <laughs> Master, Master. Oh, and then yeah. you got Anthony Hopkins and chewing the furniture oh, as well. I haven't know, you? I yeah. know. He is vampire, not Sparato. <laughs> <laughs> Wind in there. <laughs> but that central Gary Oldman performance, especially at the beginning, that is yes. uh, that's a joy to watch. That is. It is. It is a very, very good. Yeah, and no, all the bit in Transylvania is absolutely phenomenal. It goes a mm. bit westward for me when they get to London and that, but there's still some flashes of greatness in there and, and all the rest of it. It's just it kind of yeah. tension yeah. just dissipates a little bit. It, it, yeah, it, it, it lost its yeah. pacing a little bit, didn't it? I started off with one, but I've actually got three vampire comedies that are tie, oh, nice. tie in for whatever it is, fifth place or whatever it is. Yeah, Mr. Vampire, which we covered. Uh, way back I think about last February Chinese New Year which is a, a Chinese Kung Fu comedy take on The Vampire yeah. which is a really funny excellent slapstick film oh, that reminds me of what I'm going to have to mention <laughs> yeah. uh, love, love at First Bite which I absolutely love oh Love at First yeah you can't get wrong with Love at First Bite First Bite and then the other one, not so much the film, but the offshoot TV series, What We Do in the Shadows. Oh, yeah. Which is uh, the, the, the a modern day setting, a uh, group of vampires living in a house in New York. I've forgotten all about that. Yeah. It's like a fly, fly yeah, it's like a fly on the wall documentary. Um, it's it's streaming, I think it might be up on the iPlayer. Oh, the sorry, hounds. The, the hell. hounds. Yeah. The hounds. <laughs> yeah, we we said the festival was finished, but um, nah, no, you know, something's yeah. going on out there. <laughs> so right, we'll, we'll check that out before we <laughs> before we leave. But yes, what we do in the shadows, I, I highly recommend it. It's got Matt Berry in mm. it. It's got a, a great cast, and it's sort of uh, uh, well, I guess they're all two or three hundred years old, and them sort of rubbing up against the modern world in various ways. Yeah, I, I just on your things. Then I just thought of two that I'd forgotten about. First one is Fright Night. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> For a proper bit of 80s class, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, that was a good film. Yeah. That was a good one. And, uh, and, 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 and another one was uh, The Seven Golden Vampires. Oh, yes. Yeah, of course. That was Hammer, wasn't it? With Peter Cushing, now they're all kung fu yeah, and all yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, that was a nice mixing was of fun. genres, wasn't it? Yeah. It was. It wasn't. A, it was one of those films that really shouldn't work, mm. but it did. Yeah. <laughs> but somehow it worked. Yeah. And 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 the thing is, I cannot believe that I've forgotten and not even thought of it, and we not mentioned it because it's one of my favourite films, Bloody Lost Boys. Oh. oh. <laughs> How can we not have mentioned know, the Lost I Boys? Know. See, once you start on this, it, it's um, mm. it's, it's so di- even to pick a top three or something is so difficult. Yeah. 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 That was, um, I think that was a very influential film as well, and that sort of tied it in. It was. Yeah, that, that whole yeah. masquerade thing, it, it came in around that sort of time, I guess, didn't it? Yeah, well, it was mid-80s, wasn't it? And uh, around the same time that the, the Anne Rice books got mainstream popularity, yeah. I guess. Yeah. There was a, there was kind of a boon of it in that in the mid-80s, wasn't there? Mm-hmm. Because there was the Anne Rice books, there was The Lost Boys, there was Fright Night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And you had the, uh, the Eddie Murphy spoof. Oh, vam- Vampire in Brooklyn or something like that? Yeah, it? that's it. Vampire Brooklyn. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember much of that at all. I, I must have seen it back in the day, I think. Yeah. I, I remember, I, I, again, I don't remember much of it. I remember it being funny. Yeah. Uh, oh, and there was another spoof as well, wasn't there? There was Dracula Dead and Loving It. Yes. Yeah, was that the Les- uh, Leslie Nielsen one? Leslie Nielsen, yeah. 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 It was basically like, like the, the yeah, yeah, Naked Gun kind yeah. of. yeah spin-off kind of thing yeah, yeah. i thought it, it had its moments that but it wasn't quite up to the standard of, of airplane and naked gun and stuff but uh no no i think i think of all the horror ones that he did they did uh, repossessed was much funnier right yeah yeah <laughs> that was just funny <laughs> it was ridiculous but it was amusing so there we are thanks for that question David that was an excellent question and, and we could yep. well there's a whole show the vampire show which I'm sure we'll do at some point 
but yep. um, there, there's a few ideas for our our top one vampire book and film turned into sort of top twenty. <laughs> top twenty, yeah. <laughs> you know. That's the problem, isn't it? It'd be like asking about like zombie movies. Oh, <laughs> oh we'd be there all week. Yeah, yeah. It's probably <laughs> less less werewolf films, perhaps. I say there's a few of them, but mm. but maybe less. I can think of a few off the top of my head that'd be yeah, yeah. 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 But um, most of them old, uh, old like <laughs> you know, yeah. like the, the, old, um, the, the golden age of Hollywood and uh, Hammer stuff. Yeah, but, like the remake that was it, The Wolfman with Benicio de Torres and mm. um, Anthony Hopkins as a yeah. good one. I did enjoy that. Yeah, that was. A... I quite like the nineties one, Wolf with Jack Nicholson as well. All right, actually. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I went to see that at the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there we are. Thanks again for that question, David. Um, mm. Yeah, good one. Please let us know your favourite vampire films and books and, uh, you know, put them up on our Facebook group or post on the Patreon page. Indeed. Be interesting to see those. And, of course, should you have any questions related to vampires, zombies, werewolves or anything, even spam, <laughs> <laughs> do send it in to DagonSackOutlook.com. Dagon does like receiving all your letters. He does read every one. He's sometimes very slow in responding, but uh, Barley Chumali and uh, our other friend, the captain. Yeah, I'm sure he'll get back to you. Then, yeah, keep an eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> keep an eye on your windows. <laughs> right, well, I think that's all our business concluded for today. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. <laughs> uh, the bus has turned up, so we're, we better head back to Arkham before the fog descends totally. Definitely, so, definitely. Yeah, I didn't like the sound of the, the, the dogs and the scrabbling and all that earlier. I didn't like that. <laughs> yeah, it seems it seems to have died down and everything looks quiet in the square outside. So I think we'll we'll take this opportunity to uh, hightail it out of here. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for joining us today, folks, for our first trip of 2022. And um, I think we've got a bit of a musical theme for our next trip. Is that right, Tim? Indeed, yeah. We're going to have a look at uh, the music of Eric Zahn which I, I love. Yeah. Get your V-holes ready. <laughs> yes. And I believe you have a, I believe we're, there's a showing over at the cinema as well, isn't there? Yes. There's a, a film that I'm very excited to see again. It's The Phantom of Paradise, which is a 1974 film by Brian De Palma. And it's a, a, a sort of rock version of The Phantom of the Opera. I uh, can't believe I've never seen it. <laughs> It just sounds it sounds ridiculous. I why have I never seen it? It is uh yeah, it's it's a great it's a great film. It's yeah, it's got horror, it's got camp, it's got rock and roll. It's just like my <laughs> that's me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. that's gonna be a treat to watch that again and, and we'll have a chat about that. Cool. So there we go. Happy New Year to everyone. Indeed. And uh until next time, it's goodbye from me, Rob Poynton. And it's goodbye from me, Tim Mendes. 